Lecture 11, The Structure of Action and Perception. So far, we seem to be moving along fairly smoothly in our attempts to get an account of intentionality. And we found that we can explain a great deal of intentional phenomena in terms of the notion of conditions of satisfaction with a direction of fit. And it all seems to fit in uh, with certain nice intuitive notions we have about how our beliefs and desires work. But it gets a little more complicated when we start to think about actions. And actions are going to be the main topic of uh, this talk, though I try to, I'll try to say something about perception as well. But let's start naively with the apparatus we got so far. It sounds as if we ought to be able to say something like the following. If I intend to do something, I intend to go to the movies, let's say, then my intention is an intentional state, and it represents a certain state of affairs, its conditions of satisfaction. The only thing special about intentions is that they represent actions. So if I intend to do something, my intention will be satisfied if I perform the action, and we've got that uphill direction of fit. The world has to change, I have to perform the action so as to match the intention. I wish it was that simple, but it doesn't work. That's not going to work, and I'll tell you why not. Uh, to begin with, we ought to be worried about the fact that we have this special vocabulary of actions. We don't have a special vocabulary for the conditions of satisfaction of belief and desires, just states of affairs. And states of affairs can exist even if nobody believes that they exist or nobody wants them to exist. But it seems that actions can't even exist unless there's somehow an intention as part of the action. Even when you do something unintentionally, still, there is an intention in the action as well. To take a famous case, um, Oedipus married his mother unintentionally with all kinds of bad consequences down the line. But in order to marry his mother unintentionally, he had to do something intentionally. He married Jocasta intentionally. He just didn't know that that was his mother. And it looks like that he didn't perform two actions. He didn't marry two women. He only performed one action which is intentional relative to one description and unintentional relative to another description. Now, what's going on? Well, furthermore, we find, if we just try to think there's a simple relation between the intention and the action, that the action uh, repre is represented by the intention, the intention has the actions as its conditions of satisfaction, we can get counterexamples, and philosophers are very good at thinking up ingenious counterexamples, and I want to give you some famous counterexamples. Uh, the first of these is due to Rod Chisholm. Rod Chisholm says, uh, I vary his example slightly for my purposes, but it's basically taken from him. Suppose that Bill intends to kill his uncle. He's got an intention to kill his uncle. And suppose that Bill is out driving around the streets of his town thinking about his intention to kill his uncle. And when he comes up to a red light, uh, his intention to kill his uncle makes him so nervous that his foot slips off the brake and he runs over a pedestrian. Guess who? Happens to be his uncle. Okay, now he intended to kill his uncle. He did kill his uncle. His intention to kill his uncle caused him to kill his uncle. But he didn't kill his uncle intentionally. Judge, it was just an accident, he says, correctly. He did not intend to kill his uncle. He did not kill his in uncle intentionally. His intention was not satisfied. Why not? He intended to do it, and he did it. Well, let's take another example. Uh, by the way, I ought to tell us something about philosophers, that they love homicidal examples. Um, the next one is due to Don my colleague Donald Davidson, equally homicidal. Um, uh, Davidson says, imagine one climber is holding another climber on, the, on a rope. And the first climber, as Davidson says, wishes to rid himself of weight and danger. So to that end, he forms the intention of letting go of the rope. But the whole thing makes him so nervous that his hand starts to shake and he drops the rope. Now notice that's a different case from if he had said, look, I am going to let go of this rope. One, two, three, go. That's not what happened. What happened was he said, I intend to let loose of this rope. Oh my gosh, what a thought. I'm going to let go of the rope. Oh, wait a minute. Oops, I, the rope slipped. I dropped the rope. Now, in that case, he had the intention 
to release his hold on the rope. His intention caused him to release his hold, but he didn't do it intentionally. It's just like Chisholm's case, except it's uh, more restricted. I mean, it's immediate, immediate bodily behavior. There's another example that's due to Dan Bennett. That's Dan Bennett with a B. Um, and Bennett imagines the following. Again, we follow this great homicidal philosophical tradition. Smith wishes to kill Jones, and to that end, Smith goes out and fires a gun at Jones. Smith, however, is an awful shot, and he misses Jones by a mile. But unknown to Smith, there's a herd of wild pigs in the neighborhood, and the shot stampedes the herd, and I don't have to tell all an audience of philosophers what happens next. The herd of wild pigs stampedes poor Jones to death, so Smith intended to kill Jones. His intention caused the death of Jones. But even in that case, it seems funny to say he did it intentionally because things didn't go according to plan. And I'm told by lawyers that, in fact, none of these would be a case of first degree murder, even though the intention uh, was to kill and the death uh, did result. Okay, that's our problem. Our problem is to try to assimilate the theory of intentionality, that, that, uh, try to assimilate the intentionality of intention and action to the theory of intentionality that I presented in the earlier lecture. Well, let's just go to work and figure out some, uh, and look at, uh, at what we find when we examine the structure of intentions and actions. To begin with, it seems to me we need to make a distinction between intentions that you have prior to performing an action. I call those prior intentions. I intend now to go to the movies tonight, or I intend now uh, to drink a beer tonight. And the intention that I have when I'm doing something intentionally, and I don't have a label for that one, so let's say there's a distinction between the prior intention or the forward-looking intention and the intention in the actual action, the intention in action, the intention I have when I'm actually doing something. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to take simple Mickey Mouse actions like the action of raising your arm. Later on, we'll show how to get more complicated cases. We've got to start with the simple cases. Okay, there's got to be a difference between the intention I have prior to an action. So I might now form the prior intention to raise my arm in 30 seconds. But that has to be distinguished from the intention I have when I actually raise my arm when I do something intentionally, the intention in action. Why do we need this distinction? Well, you can have one without the other. You can carve one off from the other. There are lots of times I have an intention to do something, I mean, like finish some work I'm supposed to do, and I don't do it. And there are lots of things I do spontaneously without any prior intention, but nonetheless they're done intentionally. In my case, that happens all the time. I'm sitting in a chair thinking about a philosophical problem, and I suddenly jump up and start pacing around. Now, I'm pacing around intentionally, but there was no prior intention. I didn't sit there thinking, all right, shall I get up and pace around now? No, I wasn't even thinking about that. Actions that are done without a prior intention are often said to be done spontaneously. They're just done like that without any planning, without any malice aforethought. So we need that distinction between the prior intention and the intention in action. Furthermore, if we look at these a little more closely, we discover an interesting thing we didn't find with beliefs and desires. Namely, these have a causal condition in their conditions of satisfaction. And the condition is that the intention itself has to cause something. If I have a prior intention to do something, then the prior intention has to cause my doing it. Otherwise, I didn't carry out that intention. Let's take a simple example. I form a prior intention to raise my arm in 30 seconds. Now, if I watch the clock and then in 30 seconds I raise my arm, my prior intention is carried out or satisfied because I did it by way of satisfying the intention. That is to say, the intention itself caused the action, which was its condition of satisfaction. Suppose I forgot all about my intention, and 30 seconds later I raised my arm for some other reason, a passing fly ball, and I reached up to grab it. Then it's not a case of carrying out my intention because it, the intention has to cause the rest of its conditions of satisfaction if it's to be satisfied. 
Now, I need some jargon to describe that, and I'm going to say prior intentions have a causal condition in their conditions of satisfaction. They are causally self-referential because the intention itself has to function in bringing about the rest of its conditions of satisfaction. This is an old feature that's been noticed as far back as Kant, but this piece of jargon, the expression causally self-referential, I think was first coined by Gil Harmon, and, and I use it a little bit differently from him, but I want to get the basic idea is that the intention is satisfied only if the intention itself causes something to happen, and that something is the rest of the conditions of satisfaction. So a prior intention will be satisfied only if the prior intention itself causes the action, which is its condition of satisfaction. Now, I think that causally self-referential feature is a feature both of prior intentions and of the intention in action. And I'll get to how it works for intentions in action in a minute. Okay, now if we actually look at ordinary human actions, I mean, we're taking these simple cases, it seems to me we need to distinguish within the action and confining ourselves for a moment to the simple bodily actions like raising our arm. It seems to me we need to distinguish in the action itself a intentional component, a mental component, and a bodily component, a bodily movement. So if I intend to raise my arm and I then carry out that intention, the prior intention causes an intention in action, the action itself will consist of two components. The conscious intention in action, I'm intending to raise my arm, and the bodily movement, the arm actually has to go up. Simple human actions t contain two components, a mental component and a physical component, if you'll forgive me the Cartesian vocabulary for one second, or an intentional component and a bodily component. And there's, again, there's a proof of that, and the proof is you can carve one off from the other uh, and, and see what's left over as a residue. Um, there was a, a, um, a neurobiologist, a neurosurgeon, in fact, in Montreal uh, named uh, uh, Penfield, and Penfield performed interesting operations on his patients. Usually the patients had some terrible tumors, and he had to remove them. And in one case, he describes a situation where he says, I put a microelectrode on the motor cortex of a patient's brain and caused his body to move. Now that must be, the patient, these patients are awake. Uh, it must be a very strange feeling. You're sitting there or lying there and suddenly your arm goes up. Pen, uh, uh, Penfield says, invariably I ask the patient about it. And you'd think, you better ask the patient about it. You're messing around in his brain. And invariably, says Penfield, the patient says, I didn't do that. You did it. That is, what you had, I'm lying there or sitting there, my arm goes up, because Penfield is mucking around with his microelectrode on my motor cortex. I had the bodily movement without the intention in action. Does everybody see that? Uh, and the, the, the cases get more interesting even. Uh, Penfield uh, says, I can cause a patient to vocalize by stimulating the appropriate area of the motor cortex. Now that must be creepy. And you wonder, what language do these patients vocalize in? Do they sing the Star Spangled Banner? Or I mean, I, I, Penfield was Canadian. Maybe they sing the Canadian anthem. I think not. I think they probably just say, Ugh. but it must be a creepy feeling. Because you're sitting there, Penfield is mucking around in your brain, and the bodily movement comes out. The sounds come out. And, says Penfield, I invariably ask the patient, and the patient says, I didn't make that sound. You pulled it out of me. Now, those are cases where we have the normal bodily movement, but without the intention in action. So we carve off the intention in action and leave the bodily movement. We also have the other cases where you carve off the bodily movement but leave the intention in action. And those experiments go back to William James. Uh, William James describes in his uh, classic book, Principles of Psychology, he says, he performs the following experiment. We take a patient, or not, not a patient, a subject, we anesthetize his arm, 
we put him in a dark room and we tell him, please raise your arm, and then he does something, which he thinks is this, but unknown to him, we're holding his arm at his side. So the patient has an intention in action, but he does not have the bodily movement. Now what that tells me is, at least for these simple Mickey Mouse actions of the sort we've been thinking about, there are two parts to human action. There is the intention in action, and there's the bodily movement. And the c bodily movement is the condition of satisfaction of the intention and action as caused by it. That is, this intention and action has got to cause this bodily movement. So we've got, and as I said, the proof of that is you can carve off one and not have the other. Penfield uh, carved off uh, the intention and action and left the bodily movement. William James uh, carved off the bodily movement and left the intention in action. Both are oddball cases. Both are pathological cases. All right, now let's, uh, uh, that, uh, we got the distinction between the prior intention and the intention in action. We've got this causal self-referentiality of each, and we've got the claim that, at least for simple human actions, there are two components. There's the intentional component and a bodily movement. Now let's put all of those together into a theory of the intentionality of intention and action. It seems to me the intention in action has the whole action as its condition of satisfaction. That is, the intention in action will be carried out. Sorry, the, the prior intention has the whole action as its condition of satisfaction. The prior intention will be carried out only if there's a whole action. But we saw that the whole action consists of two components, the intention in action and the bodily movement. But the intention in action has to cause the bodily movement. Now, if you spell that out, you wonder how does it ever get all hanged together because you write out the conditions of satisfaction. The prior intention would be the condition of satisfaction are this prior intention has to cause the action of my raising my arm. But the condition of satisfaction of the intention in action is this intention in action has to cause the bodily movement of my arm going up. The way it all hangs together, though, I think is quite simple. Since the prior intention represents the whole action, but the whole action divides into two parts, the part of the, uh, the intention in action and the bodily movement, we can say either that the prior intention causes the whole action, or we can say that the prior intention causes the intention in action, which causes the bodily movement. And I've represented that with a rather simple diagram here, PI for prior intention, IA for intention in action, and BM for bodily movement. Now, if the action is a premeditated action, where I form a prior intention, then the prior intention has got to cause the action, but it does that by way of causing the intention in action, which causes the bodily movement. And we can already see what was wrong with some of those counter examples. Bill ran over his uncle. You remember, he killed his uncle. He formed the prior intention to kill his uncle, but there was never an intention in action. There was never a moment at which he could say and answer the question, what on earth are you trying to do? Where he says, I'm trying to kill my uncle. No, what he says is, oh my gosh, I seem to have run over a pedestrian. My foot slipped off the brake. That is to say, we went from the prior intention to the bodily movement, but there was never an intention in action, and consequently, there was never and intentional action. The same is true of Davidson's case. Bennett's a little different. I'll get to that in a few moments. The same is true of Davidson's case. In Davidson's case, the person, the, the killer had a prior intention to release his hold on the rope, but he does not go through the stages where he says, one, two, three, go. That would be where he goes to, a prior, to an intention in action. But he went from a prior intention which made him so nervous that it caused the bodily movement, but there was never an intention in action. Now, we're already getting close to having the beginnings of a theory. There's a word in ordinary English which means the same as intention in action, and that's trying. It's not exactly the same, but in general, whenever you have an intention in action and you don't have the successful bodily movement, you didn't sink the putt, or you didn't make the turn in skiing, you can say, I tried. 
whenever, and, and in William James's case, the patient didn't actually raise his arm, but he did try. Whenever there is an intention and action, there's a trying, and then the trying will be successful if the causally self-referential condition is satisfied. That is to say, if the intention and action actually causes the bodily movement, which is the rest of its condition of satisfaction. Okay, well, look, now we, we're, uh, we're off and running. It looks like we're starting to get the beginnings of a theory of the intentionality of intentional action. However, all we got so far are these Mickey Mouse cases like raising your arm. What we want to get is more complicated cases. I mean, how about starting a revolution or writing a book or doing something more interesting than just raising your arm or scratching your head? Well, to get going on that, let's... Um, following this great philosophical tradition of, of uh, repressed homicidal mania, uh, let's take a homicidal example, and I'll take one that actually occurred in history. Uh, you remember how it happened. Uh, it was in Sarajevo in uh, 1914, and these uh, bewildered uh, group of radical students decided they were going to try to assassinate uh, the Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand and his consort. And uh, one of them, Gavrilo Princip, uh, was, went off to try to, with his revolver to try to assassinate the Archduke. But he, in the usual way, everybody got mixed up and he never found the Archduke. And he was going home disconsolately, according to the standard uh, uh, textbooks, when the Archduke's driver got lost in the back streets of Sarajevo and he had to go into a side street and stop the car to try to turn it around. And there was Gavrilo confronting the Archduke and his unfortunate Morganatic wife. Uh, and so Gavrilo then performed the deadly act. Now suppose we try to explore Gavrilo's intentionality in the form of his intention in action. And you remember the way you get at that is you ask him, Gavrilo, what on earth are you trying to do? Or what on earth are you doing? That gets at his intention in action. Now it seems to me there is a kind of sequence of things that he can say. He can say, I am pulling the trigger, I'm firing the gun, I'm shooting the Archduke, I'm killing the Archduke, I'm striking a blow against Austria, and I am avenging Serbia. All of those are parts of the conditions of satisfaction of his complex intention. Now notice there's a lot of things that went on up here that happened that are not part of his intention and action. Uh, we know that he caused a lot of neurons to fire. We know that he uh, secreted acetylcholine at the axon end plates of his motor neurons. But unless he's some kind of medical student, when we say, Gavrilo, what on earth are you trying to do? He doesn't say, I'm secreting acetylcholine. Get out of my way. Uh, no, that's for, I mean, that's prior. That's, go, that, that's at a level which is before he ever gets uh, started. Furthermore, there are a lot of things going off here on the side. Um, he's moving air molecules in the back streets and he's making a lot of noise. Uh, and there are a lot of things that happened down here afterwards. Um, uh, he uh, started the First World War. Uh, some people will tell you that he caused the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, we know that he made uh, uh, William II, the Emperor of Germany, very angry. Uh, we know that he ruined uh, Sir Edward Grey's summer season in London. I mean, that was just, uh, Grey was the British Foreign Secretary, and that was the end. He never had a decent party after that moment. So he ruined, I mean, but, but Gavrilo couldn't say, well, I'm ruining uh, Edward Grey's summer party season, or I'm angry. I'm William II, or I'm starting the First World War, because those were not part of the intention in action. Uh, we know that he made holes in the upholstery of the car. The car, by the way, you can see in Vienna. It's on display. Marvelous car. Uh, but if he said, uh, I was making holes in the upholstery, and those people got in the way, then it, history would have been different. I mean, then we'd have a different conception of history. Okay, so now our question is, what's the relation between this stuff that I've written on the board and all that other stuff? Now, philosophers have some jargon for this. Uh, they say that this capacity where you can expand or contract 
a description of an action. They call that the accordion effect because you can expand and contract the accordion. Some philosophers say you can contra expand and contract it indefinitely. I don't think that's right. Uh, if you're talking about the intention, intentional action, then the boundaries of the accordion are set by the content of the intention in action. The reason all that other stuff is not done intentionally is that it's not part of the content of this complex intention in action. It's stuff that happened here as an unintended consequence or stuff that happened off to the side as an unintended side effect or stuff that happened prior to that in the brain which was not part of the intention. It wasn't part of what Gavrilo was trying to do. Now notice, and this is the crucial point about complex intentions, these are not independent of each other. That is to say, Gavrilo doesn't intend to just pull the trigger and fire the gun and shoot the Archduke, but he intends to do one of these by means of or by way of doing the other. So he shoots the Archduke by firing the gun and he fires the gun by pulling the trigger, and he kills the Archduke by shooting the Archduke. There is, I believe, a break that comes here between the death of the Archduke and striking a blow against Austria because all of these are causally related. The pulling of the trigger causes the firing of the gun. The firing of the gun causes the shooting of the Archduke. The shooting causes the killing, but, or at least it causes the death. But here you have a constitutive relation. Killing the Archduke doesn't cause a blow to be struck against Austria. In that context, it just is striking a blow against Austria. It, is, it expresses the urge to strike a blow against Austria. It doesn't cause some further event. In that context, it just counts as striking a blow against Austria. And striking that blow, uh, so Gavrilo, as Gavrilo sees it, counts as avenging Serbia. So these are causal by means of relation up here, where you do something by means of doing something else. But you don't perform a whole bunch of actions. All of this is one large action. And then down here, you don't have a causal relation, but you have a constitutive relation. Killing the arch to just constitutes striking a blow. Striking a blow just constitutes avenging Serbia. All right, so what we've done then is give a simple account of the relation of intentionality and action in such a way that we can show that the intentional content of the action is always given by the intention in action, is given by the intentional content of the intention in action, and that can be as complicated as you like. It consists of a series of cases where you do something by means of doing something else or by way of doing something else. And in general, it seems to me those will be either causal or constitutive. I don't want to say those are the only kinds, but those are the two most favored kinds. I mean, the, the two kinds that are the most obvious and the most common. All right, now with that in mind, then, let's go back and see how we deal with the puzzles that we begin with. We begin with uh, three puzzles. Uh, why should there be a, a separate vocabulary of action? We don't have a separate vocabulary for the intentional content, uh, for the conditions of satisfaction of beliefs and desires. And furthermore, why does there seem to be a special connection so it doesn't seem to even have an action unless you have an intention? And third, how do we deal with the counter examples? Let's start with the counterexamples. Let's take them first. I already briefly answered the Chisholm and the Davidson counterexample. In each case, there was a prior intention. The prior intention caused the bodily movement, but the prior intention was not satisfied and there was no intentional action because there was never an intention in action. There was no point at which the killer could say or think, I am now killing the victim. What the killer thinks in, in, in the case of Chisholm's example is, my foot has slipped off the brake, I've run over a pedestrian accidentally. 
And in the Davidson example, it's, oops, I have let the rope slip, even though I didn't intend to do, to, do so. So the reason that those counterexamples are counterexamples to the claim that any bodily movement caused by a prior intention is an intentional action is that that claim is false. Uh, the correct claim is that a, an intentional action must always contain an intention in action. Indeed, any human action is any event that contains an intention in action. If it is a successfully performed action, then the intention in action will be satisfied and the act will be carried out. This, the second claim, the second question, uh, the, 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 rather the third example that we were dealing with was Bennett's case where Smith went to, uh, to try to kill Jones and he did fire the gun. He did have an intention in action, but he did not perform an intentional action of killing Jones because he didn't hit Jones with a bullet. Rather, what happened, you remember, was that he, the uh, herd of wild pigs stampeded, trampling poor Jones to death. Now, why is that a counterexample? Because in that case, you've got a prior intention. Smith says, I'm going to kill Jones. He has an intention in action. If you ask him, what are you now doing? Uh, and he uh, pulls uh, the trigger. He says, I'm now killing Jones. And he does kill Jones. He produces a bodily movement that has the death of Jones as a consequence. Why isn't that an intentional action? That case is closer, by the way, than the earlier cases because we do have an intention in action. But the reason that it's not a case of an intention, of an intentional action, is the accordion here. That is to say, things are not going to plan. What we take for granted is this relation. We're assuming that, he, uh, uh, that when he pulls the trigger, he intends to fire the gun, and he intends the firing of the gun to cause the shooting of the archduke because he intends the bullet to go from the gun into the... Uh, sorry, not the archduke, but in this case, Jones. He intends the firing of the gun to cause the shooting of Jones because he intends the bullet to go from the gun into Jones's body. That didn't happen. So the problem in the Bennett case is different from the problem in the Davidson and in the Chisholm case, because in Bennett's case, we actually had an intention in action, but it isn't carried out because it was a complex intention in action, and there are features in the intermediate stages that simply weren't satisfied. You can see that if you imagine, he suppose he didn't have the intention to kill Jones by putting the bullet into his body. Suppose Smith knows I'm a lousy shot, but Smith has an assistant named Brown, and Brown says, look, boss, don't worry about your lousy aim. I'm taking care of everything. You just point your gun in that direction. Leave the rest to me. Now, we suppose Brown knows all about the herd of wild pigs, and Brown knows perfectly well that Smith is a lousy shot, and it would be a miracle if he managed to hit Jones. Now, in that case, Smith fires his gun. Jones dies, but there I'm inclined to say that's an intentional action because he could do it blindfold. He could close his eyes to do it, and he thinks to himself, uh, look, I'm paying Brown to take care of these details. He says this is going to work, and it does. Most philosophers who discuss this describe these cases as deviant causal chains, as causal chains that are kind of oddball or not you know, in order, not normal. But that's not the problem. The problem is not their normality. The problem is, is it part of the intentional content that they're required to be normal? In the case, in the original counterexample, we are assuming with Bennett that it's part of the presupposition that we're taking for granted that the intentional content is supposed to be normal. You fire the gun, the bullet goes from the gun to the body, the bullet enters the body, wounds the person, and the person dies as a result. But in this revised case that I gave you, we don't take that for granted. We make a break with it, and yet it's still a case of an intentional killing. And this is the point. It's not the deviance or the oddball character of the causation that determines whether or not the action was carried out intentionally. What matters is whether or not the deviance or the oddball character should have been represented or not represented in the content of the intention. It's the conditions of satisfaction of the intention that matter. 
Okay, so I think that takes care of our three counterexamples. How about our earlier a problem? What about intentional actions? And why do you have to have, why does the intention have to be part of the action? Well, I think we now see the answer to that. Every human action has to have an intentional action, conscious or unconscious, as one of its components. An intentional action is just an action where the intention and action is satisfied, where it actually meets the causally self-referential condition of causing the bodily movement or the rest of its conditions of satisfaction. And an unintentional action is just an intentional action that has features that weren't intended that has features that were not part of the content of the intentional action. So Oedipus performed the intentional action of marrying Jocasta. He performed the unintentional action of marrying his mother, even though he only, perf only performed one action, the one action of marrying this woman. And yet it is intentional relative to the intentional content, marry Jocasta, and unintentional relative to the intentional content, marry my mother, because he didn't have that intentional content. That's not part of what he intended. Now, one of the things I don't understand, and I think it has to do with the background that I mentioned in the last lecture, is how do we distinguish between genuinely unintentional actions and just all kind of oddball things that happen that you don't even think of as part of the action. So when he married... Uh, Joe Casta, he moved his elbow in relation to the North Pole or uh, altered his gravitational relations to the moon. But he certainly wasn't thinking about that. That's just, those are just odd side effects, odd consequences. And it seems funny to me to say he moved, he performed the unintentional action of altering his gravitational relationships to the moon. But why? Well, I think that's part of our background. We only think of the cases of possible actions, intentional or unintentional, relative to the space of possibilities that we take our background as providing us with. Before I conclude by bringing in the problem of perception, I want to point out that this model actually fits a lot of cases. I've just tried to describe bodily movement and physical actions, but it obviously works equally well for mental actions and negative actions. Uh, my wife says to me before we go to a dinner party, try not to be rude to the host. Uh, who, me? Rude to the host? Uh, and I then perform the negative action of, of uh, having an, uh, a prior intention, don't be rude to the host, I'm trying not to be rude to the host. Uh, okay, sometimes I succeed. Uh, that's a case where you have negative actions. Sit still is a negative action. Or you can have mental actions. Form a mental image of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, there it is, over there on the right bank. And those are cases where, again, you have an intention and action, only it's not a bodily movement this time, but it's the formation of an image. So I think it gives us, this account gives us a perfectly general account. Now, there's one thing I've said that's slightly unrealistic, and that is I've said all of these are part of the content of the intention and action. But as we get more skillful, uh, we're assuming Gavrilo is kind of a beginner, uh, and he has to think, oh yeah, that thing's the trigger, I've got to yank on that. But if he's skilled with this, he might just think, shoot now. Uh, the level of the intention will rise to the level of your background skill. So a beginning skier has to think, put the weight on the downhill ski, edge the ski into the hill, let the uphill ski slide parallel to the down. That's what the textbooks say. The good skier just thinks, turn left. And the really good skier thinks, go down the mountain. Uh, uh, if you listen to what ski coaches say before a race, you'll see what, which parts they're getting at, what they take for granted as a level of skill. They don't say, uh, now turn when you get to the red gate. If they have to tell you that, you shouldn't be in a race. What they tell you are things like, um, stay close to the gates in the flush, and when you get to the flat, keep your speed. Hold your speed in the flat part of the course. Now, that's the kind of stuff they tell you. By the way, there are interesting differences here. You see, uh, when I was coached by American coaches, they go for details in here. They want to be in all the details of the intention and action. So you say, after you get down the course, you say, Coach, what am I doing wrong? And a coach will say, well, your left elbow was out a little too far there. Uh, and I'd like you to sh make the shift from one, weight from one ski to another a little less abruptly. Do the foot-to-foot -foot more smoothly. 
But Austrian coaches, you ask the Austrian coach, well, coach, what am I doing wrong? What should I do different? They just say, schneller, go faster. Yeah, but coach, what about my elbows? Schneller, just go faster. Now, in a way, I, I thought, well, you know, you got a bunch of dumb Austrian peasants. What do you expect? But in a way, I think they were probably right. Uh, the right way to, to acquire any skill is not to worry too much about the details, but just get your body to do it. Let the body take over so the intention and action will rise to the level of the background ability. Now, the temptation is to wonder, well, how skillful can we get? I mean, could we get so skillful at life that we just thought, well, all I need to intend to do is flourish, just Live, flourish. I don't think so. We're never going to be that skillful. You've always got to be able to make your way with conscious intentions. But the more skillful you are, the higher the level of your intentionality. The more, the more stuff you can just take for granted. I want to conclude this lecture with what I promised I would talk about, namely the, uh, I, I, the at least uh, at a preliminary level, a theory of perception. And I want to say the stuff we've been saying about in prior intention, excuse me, prior intentions and intention and action carries over to perception and memory. The only thing is you get a different direction of fit. My intentions, uh, prior intentions and my intention and action have the world to mind direction of fit because the aim of intentions is to change the world. I form the intention to lift my watch and I lift my watch. Then the world changes to match the content of my intention. That's the world to intention direction of fit, and it has causal self-referentiality. But now suppose I look at my watch, then it seems to me we've also got the causally self-referential feature, because the watch is being there, has got to cause my experience. But the direction of fit is different. In the case of the intention to raise my watch, the direction of fit was from the world to the mind, and the direction of causation was from the mind to to the world. My mind is causing a change in the world. So the arrows are going in, in opposite ways there. That is to say, it's the, my, it's the world to mind direction of fit, mind to world direction of causation. But now suppose I look at my watch, then again I've got causal self-referentiality, because the watch is being there has got to cause my experience. So I have the world to mind direction of causation. I've got this uphill direction of causation, but I've got the mind-to-world direction of fit because if I see the world the way it really is, and thus my perception is satisfied, it can only be because the world actually is the way that I see it, that is to say my perception matches an independently existing world. Now this is a deep thought and I want to leave you with it uh, at the end of this lecture and that's this. There is an exact mirror image parallelism between the structure of cognition and the structure of volition, between the structure of perception and memory on the one hand and the structure of prior intention and intention and action on the other. The aim of perception and memory is to represent how the world is or was in the past and thus they have the mind to world direction of fit. But they achieve that direction of fit only in virtue of world to mind direction of causation. It's basic and fundamental to our conception of how we relate to reality that we think we represent how the world is in our perception and memory only in virtue of the fact that the world's being that way causes it to represent it that way. We get mind-to-world direction of fit in virtue of world-to-mind direction of causation. With action, with voluntary intentional action, it's exactly the opposite of that. It's basic to our conception of intentional action that if we change the world to make it be the way we want it to be and thus achieve world to mind direction of fit, it's only in virtue of the fact that our trying, our mental effort to make it be that way causes it to be that way. That is to say, we achieve world to mind direction of fit only in virtue of mind to world direction of causation.